Most people come to Arizona to see one thing in particular. It took nearly five million years to make. It's 277 miles long. It's a mile deep, and it's one of the seven natural wonders of the world. And it's the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. The canyon reveals two billion years of Earth history, sliced open by a river. The rock exposed at the bottom is half the age of the Earth itself, whereas the rock at the top of the canyon is relatively young, only a quarter of a billion years in age. And although this is not the deepest, nor the widest canyon in the world, it's surely the most spectacular. In fact, it's hard to know where to look first. But with over five million visitors each year, the Grand Canyon tourism has to be organised. There's a visitor centre at the South Rim, even a park newspaper, and all the best viewpoints are clearly signposted. I met up with one of the park rangers for an insider's view. So Jenny, how long have you been a park ranger? I've been a park ranger for seven seasons in the last four years here at Grand Canyon. All oh, right. Now, you have such a vast amount of visitors every day. Does it cause a lot of problems? Well, we do get approximately five million people in every year. And especially in the summer months, the biggest problem we see is with parking. Um, the one thing that we suggest for people is to get in early in the morning, find themselves a safe, mm -hmm. legal parking place, and then take the free shuttle around the rest of the day. Right. Now, you see this place every single day. Does, mm -hmm. it, does it still amaze you? I think it's hard to ever look at Grand Canyon and not be in complete awe of it. It really is. Uh, having it in your backyard doesn't diminish that a little bit, not at all. But the only problem with the Grand Canyon is it's just too big to take in. Most of the time you feel like you're looking at a film backdrop. So the only way to get a real sense of scale of this natural monument is to head down. And there are only two ways to do this, on foot or by mule. Sean, what we need to do today is keep a nice, tight, compact group. And you will find that these mules walk very close to the edge. There is nothing you can do about that. Uh, they just want to make sure that you get the very best view today. So you just sit up there and enjoy it. And don't worry about how narrow these trails are. These mules are going to take really good care of us today. They're very experienced. They've done this for years and years. And you just let them take care of it, stay close together, and we'll be fine. Great, let's do it. We took the Bright Angel Trail, which is nine miles long a steep and winding drop of 4,460 feet to the river below. This is not the most relaxing way to see the canyon. You have to be quite fit, and some of the drops alongside the trail are very steep. There's also a year's waiting list. Well, we made it. Not all the way to the bottom, that's another two and a half hour ride. The problem is, we've now got to go four and a half miles straight back up. Now I know why John Wayne walked the way he did. If you head south from the canyon, you eventually reach the city of Tucson. 117 miles from Phoenix, the state capital, but only 60 miles north of Mexico, this is the sunniest city in Arizona, with around 350 days of sunshine a year. The Spanish were the first settlers, building a military garrison here in 1776. They came in search of gold, but settled for saving souls. One of the oldest buildings in Tucson is the Mission San Javier del Bac. The church is also known as the White Dove of the Desert because it looks so picturesque from a distance. It's considered one of the best examples of Spanish colonial architecture in America today and is still used by the Native American population nearby. The cultural heritage of Tucson is dominated by its Spanish-Mexican roots, and it's most evident in the architecture of the El Presido district. This area used to lie at the heart of the old city, but there's not much left now. Much has been rebuilt and turned into restaurants, shops and inns. However, 
the main reason most people come to Tucson is to live out their Wild West fantasies by turning them into reality. But that never happened to Clint Eastwood. This film set forms part of the old Tucson studios, home of many more serious shootouts since 1939. The first film made here was Arizona, and since then over 200 different westerns have been shot here with the help of some of the fastest guns in the west. Unfortunately, when we visited, the studios were closed and still under construction after a recent fire. But I managed to speak with one of the guides who'd worked here for over 10 years. Uh, I wasn't here at the time, but uh, John Wayne did four films at Old Tucson. And while he was here doing his last film, Rio Lobo, uh, he was called from Hollywood and said that he had won a nomination, you know, for the best actor. And so he left Old Tucson and went back to Hollywood to uh, uh, collect his trophies and so forth. And uh, he was back the next morning, seven o'clock, he drove in the Old Tucson Studios and went right to the set. And as he walked into the set, everybody turned around. And of course, everybody had a patch over their eye because he had won the nomination for True Grit. It went so far, they even had one for his horse. <laughs> so he got a big bang out of that. They say he got uh, kind of emotional when all that took place. Back in town, you also have the opportunity to live like cowboys by staying in one of the many guest or dude ranches. The rooms are extremely spacious and offer all the modern conveniences of home. And the ranch itself has everything you would expect, including a rodeo arena and around 150 working horses. All these facilities don't come cheap, but breakfast is included. So Bob, how long have you owned the ranch? Well, we're the third family to have owned it now. The ranch started in 1868, and we're the third family. We've been here about 35 years now. Really? And you're surrounded by amazing cactus everywhere. Well, this is a this is a wonderful desert. The Sonoran Desert has a uniqueness to it that you just don't find in any other deserts. The specialization of the cactus and the different trees and the animals are terrific. And on the ride this morning, what sort of animals can we uh, expect to see? Well, we're likely to see some rattlesnakes probably, and uh, certainly the coyote, and we may be lucky to see some javelina and even some mountain lion and things like that. Really? Mm -hmm. That'll be great. If you don't get to see much animal life in the desert or fancy a closer look without getting eaten, then a visit to the Sonora Desert Museum gives you a good idea of what really lives out there. From the very small and furry to the even smaller. The museum is like a zoo really, in pleasant surroundings and all the animals are extremely well looked after. I'm glad I didn't meet one of those in the desert. But they say the most dangerous animal in the world is man, and an hour and a half's drive brings you to the home of certainly the most notorious gunfighters in the West, Tombstone. It's known by many as the town too tough to die, although first impressions make you wonder what all the fuss was about. The old silver mining town of Tombstone is now a tourist mecca and is solely remembered for a 30 second shootout which happened outside the infamous OK Corral in 1881. It involved the well-known and respected lawman Wyatt Earp and his brothers against the brutal Clanton brothers. During the shootout, three died and are buried here, along with the 200 or so other cowboys. 
who couldn't draw their guns fast enough. However, not everything is dead and buried here. There are still a few old buildings that have been restored, such as the Birdcage Theatre, one of the Cowboys' main gambling hangouts. Another is this saloon bar. Well, I've visited the Grand Canyon. I've been a cowboy for a while, even if it was more as a city slicker than a low-down hombre. But there's one more thing I want to do. 